Coming up on the DMT 1 to 1 show, episode 76, on the 24th of September 2014, an interview with the, the CEO of the company who sampled, Nadav Poraz. This week's show is brought to you by Play MPE, providing secure music distribution and promotional services to the world's largest labels for over 10 years. Play MPE can be accessed on Windows and Mac computers, iOS, Android and BlackBerry mobile devices. Find out more on plaympe.com. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT 1 to 1 show and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome the CEO of Who Sample, Nadav Porat. So hi Nadav and thanks for joining me, how's it going? Hi Andrea, it's a pleasure to be here, thanks for having me, all good, we're very excited over here. And it's great to have you on, I mean I can't believe that I haven't had you guys on in the last five years, it's just absolutely insane, and uh, especially we're both in the UK, it's just, it doesn't make any sense, but uh, uh, so let's remedy all that today, and uh, first of all let's kick off by talking about uh, who sampled, what is it for people that, for the very few people in my audience that may not have heard of the company before. Right, yeah, so uh, Who Sampled is uh, nowadays the leading resource for any fans of sample-based music primarily and also uh, cover versions and remixes. Uh, and it's a music discovery experience that's uh, built on the notion of exploring the DNA of music. So you discover music by tracing all of those links between tracks and artists, uh, be it samples or covers or remixes. So we tell you what samples are in what track and uh, what covers have been made for uh, any song um, and it's a huge uh, at the core of the experience it's a huge database that's um, over 270,000 tracks now um, so really a vast uh, resource of information for music lovers yeah and, and essentially it started out as, as, a, as a crowdsource project right yeah and it still is so, um, you know, it works a bit uh, in a wiki-like manner. We've got over 10,000 contributors of all of that content. But the main difference from uh, a resource like Wikipedia is that all of the content that goes live on the service is actually being checked beforehand. So, right. uh, you know, we, we pride ourselves on the quality. Um, uh, we've got uh, a pool of moderators who help us manage that content and verify that it's accurate, etc. Yeah. And so uh, t tell me a little bit about the first steps of the service. So wh when did you realize it was a thing and it was actually starting to catch on? So uh, we are actually getting very close to our sixth birthday now. So the site was launched in late 2008. Um, and it was almost like a side project, you know, something that was um, very interesting uh, for for me and my, my co-founder back then um, to just put out there because we thought it's something that's, um, you know, not pretty um, available in the right way, you know, this sort of information. And we were very uh, big music fans and we always loved uh, tracing the origins of samples. Uh, so we just put it out there, you know, it's a very basic website and we didn't know how many people are going to be interested and how large it can get. Uh, so we just uh, opened it up uh, with a handful of samples that we knew about, about 300 samples. Um, and very quickly we started to appear in search results uh, and uh, people just started to find us because they were looking for that information. Uh, and then that led to contributors starting to join in, so more and more contributors and then more and more moderators and more and more content. And here we are six years later being uh, doing it day in, day out. And, um, you know, it's now a massive database and a, a very important resource for music fans worldwide. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the, the company has been uh, uh, evolving, of course. Uh, and one of the things that's, that I find interesting is that you are very much a resource for people that are excited about music and want to learn more about the music they're listening to. But you also have built this huge amount, uh, you know, this huge database of data at, at, at the back end. So uh, how are you guys dealing with that? Are, are you, do you guys feel like you, you're always going to be a front end service or do you actually pr provide some of that data to third parties or via APIs uh, as part of your model as well? Yeah, so, you know, we are a platform and we do something that is um, very generic and can service many different experiences in, in multiple ways. So it's quite unusual that for us as a music uh, startup, we have four different revenue streams. So we have the uh, consumer facing aspects. Um, and then, you know, in terms of how we make money, it's the display advertising on the service, yeah. um, as well as the... Um, uh, affiliate links to music downloads, you know, on iTunes, Amazon, you know, that, 
that, that usual standard model. And we also have a paid iPhone app. So that, you know, costs uh, $3 or two pounds. Uh, and that generates revenue for us as well. And But our fourth one, which is becoming very interesting for us as a company, is the uh, B2B services and, you know, metadata licensing and technology licensing yeah. that relates to our database. And uh, this is where we are uh, seeing uh, some um, very promising successes. And we think, uh, you know, uh, it's a huge growth area for our business. Absolutely. I mean, we, we can see that the services are sort of scrambling to try and find the best way to recommend music to, to people. And uh, uh, what better way than being able to relate tracks uh, also by who has been sampled by whom and sort of uh, connect the dots uh, that way. It's a little bit like I know there are companies out there that are gathering, for example, all information around session, mu session musicians. Uh, and in, similarly, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that people will be really excited about knowing who else used this track. And for some, in some cases, you can find maybe, you know, up to like 30, 40 tracks that have used the same samples or more. So uh, it's kind of it's <laughs> insane how many people might have used the same the same little bit uh, of a song. And uh, so looking at the platforms, you mentioned mobile and iOS, uh, but you guys also had a big news uh, this week uh, around uh, Android, which you didn't have before. And so what's what's going on on that front? Yeah, correct. So, you know, uh, part of uh, what we do as a consumer facing service is listen to our users every day. And by far the most requested feature or development for the service was to um, take the experience uh, that we have on iPhone to Android. And it's definitely something that we've wanted to do for a while. And we were uh, investigating the, the, the right ways to do it, you know, and, and uh, we knew that there are various challenges on Android. You know, with device fragmentation and different screen sizes and different technologies. Uh, so we really wanted to get it right, and it took us, you know, a little bit of time. Uh, but finally, you, yeah, you know, uh, the, the Android app is out, and um, we're hoping that it'll make uh, many people happy with uh, one interesting difference being that the Android app is free uh, right. and is ad-supported, ad you know, as opposed to the iPhone app, which is still paid uh, and doesn't have ads in it. So uh, it is certainly uh, something that we see as a potential mass market product, and we would uh, uh, love to see any uh, music fan on the planet, ha you know, have who sampled installed on their phone because we think it's a very important part of the music discovery experience. Yeah, it's interesting also, like, uh, I, 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 did, the, did the screen sizes uh, play into your decision as well? Because uh, I guess, like, on, on, a, on an Android phone, the screen real estate is usually f f a fair amount bigger than the iPhones, at least up, to, up until now, up until the release of the, of the new phones. And so there's actually, in theory, there's actually more space to display advertising alongside the content, whilst on the iPhone, the, you know, it's a lot more crammed. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, we don't put the ads on there to annoy people and we don't want it to be something that, you know, completely takes over the experience. Um, so the fact that there are larger screens on Android, you know, has helped our decision to say, OK, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world if there are ads on there. And hopefully they're going to be relevant and interesting to the users as well. So, um, yeah, that, that was certainly a consideration. And now iPhones are getting bigger as well. So, you know, who knows uh, what that's going to mean for us? Yeah, exactly. I guess it's, it's a good way of doing some A-B testing for the next few months anyway, and then figure out how the revenue streams compare, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, uh, looking at how people are using the, the platform overall, is there any difference between what people are searching for on mobile and what people are searching for on desktops uh, on, on the go? Or is this sort of fairly sim similar queries? I was wondering if you'd picked up any interesting patterns there. Um, generally speaking, people are still uh, looking for similar content. Uh, you know, the most popular content on the site is the same most popular content on the app. Yeah. Um, the cool feature that we have on the app, and that's on iPhone and Android, is that you can scan your music library for those interesting connections. And that really has uh, made the searches on iPhone uh, very diverse because it, it is something very personalized and you, just, you probably find out things that you wouldn't be looking for proactively, say, with a search box on the website. But if it's kind of like brought to you automatically with a library scanning feature, then you actually engage with it and you drill down into it. And that is something that users keep on telling us how valuable it is, um, uh, which is great. And beyond that, the mobile experience is actually, so far, certainly with iPhone, it's been much more uh, of a drill-down experience, very engaged. You know, you can 
pretty much tap on any name and any track on there and it just takes you from one page to another. It's uh, like a rabbit hole of discovery and the engagement is very, very high. Yeah. Um, and also users of the app open it uh, much more often than, say, website visitors in the site per month. So that yeah. is certainly very interesting. Absolutely, and I know, uh, hopefully in the next uh, few months or in the next year we're going to see some sort of deeper integration with uh, Spotify APIs or other sort of streaming services APIs so we can get that data uh, uh, when we're listening to music that is not on the phones as well. That would be pretty awesome too. And uh, so looking at samples, of course, uh, uh, I was talking this week, on the uh, last week actually on the show, about uh, uh, the latest uh, you know, uh, Jay-Z stance uh, t- talking about micro samples and how uh, he thinks that you know, uh, when, when it's like a fraction of a second shouldn't be... Uh, copyrightable in that sense and so uh, how, how deep do the, your users go as far as listing samples do they actually pick up on these like micro samples and 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 everything else <laughs> they do yeah so you know in the early days of the site we said like we're not interested in super short samples uh, let's focus on the interesting the big stuff yeah. but our community is uh, almost militant on getting it right and, and yeah. being comprehensive and listing everything and and we you know eventually decided that that's indeed the right approach it's very subjective to say this is important this is you know long enough it's you know and, and those sorts of considerations you know as long as the sample can be very clearly verified and it's uh, clearly identifiable which is often a challenge with micro samples you know because if, if it is just a second long then you know we don't want to be in a speculative position where we say, you know, it's 80% of samples, so we list it. So we really try to only list uh, samples that are 100% accurate. Obviously, you know, some mistakes can happen with a crowd sourced um, uh, type of mechanism, you know, even though it gets checked, there can be mistakes and they are constantly reported to us as well. We keep on fixing the data all the time. Uh, but yes, you will find short samples on who sampled as well, as long as they can be very clearly identified. Uh, some of them are, are very important, uh, uh, you know, especially in genres like hip hop, it's something that is very contextual and comes as part of the culture. So that if you have, a, you know, little Chuck D or Flavor Flav uh, shout, or a James Brown shout, you know, that for kind of as part of the bedrock of that culture, yeah. just having that micro sample in there gives it this extra uh, emotional aspect, possibly even. Uh, so you shouldn't discount, uh, the, the micro samples are in there for, for a reason and yeah. producers put them in there because they have a very special meaning to the listener. Absolutely, and and I finally want to ask you about uh, you know of course the the kind of data that you have uh, aside from being interesting for for services as well for for historical reason it's also really interesting to try and map uh, I guess you guys have an incredible map of where tracks dispersed and how certain things you know uh, fed into another genre by a tangential way even by random sort of choice and so have you have you found that there's a lot of people that are trying to get access to your data from historical reasons or researchers or academics that are trying to figure out sort of how did certain things evolve how did certain genres blend into something else thanks to sampling yeah absolutely so you know thankfully we are very widely recognized as the leading worldwide resource for disinformation and we get approached quite often uh, by academics and researchers uh, to conduct research on that data and we are always very welcoming uh, to that you know we we're open to to um, those applications and uh, provide uh, the data for free so if there are any academics listening they can certainly feel free to get in touch with us and they will get our support um, we would like to see more research and understanding and knowledge built around sample based music because we think that helps with uh, finding solutions for it yeah um, and there has there's been a couple of research papers uh, based purely on who sampled data that were already published and we're hoping to see several more in the next few months uh, with researchers that we've been supporting. You know, it's both in terms of the analysis of the data itself, but also in terms of visualizing it. Uh, we think there's huge potential in just showing how that universe is all mapped out yeah. and correlates. So that, that's pretty fascinating. That's awesome. And yeah, I can't wait to see something along those lines. Uh, I, I, I'm just, I can't help thinking about something on the lines of, uh, you know, discover 
you know, sort of with lots of stuff sp sprouting from one from one little bubble and, and telling me all about uh, the samples that uh, derived from that. And uh, well, uh, Nadav, uh, once again, the big news is that the Android app is out uh, by the time this airs, and so uh, go get it if you have an Android phone and you haven't been able to. It's also free, so you don't have to pay any money, which is uh, perfect. If you are an iOS user, uh, you you have to pay for it, but it's well worth it, so you might as well. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's fairly easy on on uh, on iOS, so go for it. And uh, again, it's whosample.com. You can find everything about the company on there too. And Nadav, it was uh, such a pleasure having you on, and hopefully I'll have you on back soon uh, with any news from the company. Uh, keep in touch. Absolutely, that'll be my pleasure. Thanks a lot, Andrea. And thanks so much for listening to the DMT One to One show. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com and click through to the links uh, to the DMT One to One on the left hand side of the page. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and until next time. If you enjoyed watching or listening to the show and would like to find more, head on to digitalmusictrends.com.